Hello, and welcome to the first of our artist lectures for the Contemporary Northwest Art Awards. Um, I'm Bonnie Lane Malcolmson, the Arlene and Harold Schnitzer Curator of Northwest Art here at the Portland Art Museum. And welcome to all of you. I'm now going to sound like your local movie theater. If you have cell phones, please either turn them off or turn them to quiet. Thank you. It's nothing like having a cell phone go off in the middle of a lecture. We just hate that. Um, I'm really pleased today to uh, be able to introduce Willem Volkerts, um, and I'm going to give you a little brief uh, biography of Willem before he comes up to speak to you about his work. And then we're going to, any of you who would like to join Willem in the gallery, um, after the talk we'll go over to the show and you can ask him check questions or whatever you'd like to do. Um, <laughs> yeah about his work um, with it in real life. Um, so um, it was a great pleasure and it's always very difficult to curate uh, this exhibit. We get incredible um, applicants from a nominated pool of uh, around 230 artists and um, then I and my co-curator this year, Jessica Hunter Larson from the Idea Space at Colorado College um, chose the first 24 finalists and then from that pool of finalists after doing studio visits chose the um, seven artists, really eight artists and, and one artist collaborative husband and wife team to be in this exhibit. Um, it was a pleasure for me to see that Willem Volkerts was nominated because I think Willem is one of the very top artists um, working out of the state of Montana. And I also had the pleasure to first see Willem's work in 1970 in Seattle at the Polly Friedlander Gallery where he was exhibiting. And uh, I always remembered his neon work. I'd never seen an artist working in neon. I was in high school when I saw his work. And um, then we met later in 1981 at the Kansas City Art Institute where he was at the time director of admissions and also I think running the uh, foundation program or something, sort of, sort of running the foundation program, yeah. And um, we had a little exchange and he said he was from Seattle and I said, what kind of work do you do? And he said he did neon and I said, did you have a show at the Polly Friedlander Gallery in 1970? And he said, yes. And I said, I loved your work. So, <laughs> so this is the Northwest art world. Sometimes it takes um, 45 years or so to kind of be able to give somebody whose work you love a show, but yeah, get around to it eventually. So um, Willem was born in Amsterdam and um, moved to the United States, moved to Seattle um, when he was 14 years old. He graduated um, from the University of Washington uh, with a Bachelor of Arts degree with honors. And then he received a Master of Fine Arts degree with honors from Mills College in Oakland, California. Um, he's had a 35 year teaching career, including teaching at Ohio State University, um, Kansas City Art Institute, Leeds College of Art in England, and Montana State University where he also served as um, director of the School of Art. Um, he's had 45 solo exhibitions, including that first one that I saw at Polly Friedlander Gallery. And then, um, I'm not going to read the whole list of galleries, but in lots of wonderful galleries. And uh, he's shown around the United States and in Europe and will be having a show this next fall in Amsterdam at the Holocaust Museum, is that correct? Uh, or next year, early next year. Early next year, so you should all go to Amsterdam early next year to see the show. It's going to be a very powerful show um, based on uh, uh, some of the um, uh, events of World War II. And um, uh, so I think that I'm going to try to go. Um, he's received numerous grants and fellowships, including an Adolf and Esther Gottlieb Foundation Individual Artist Grant, uh, Fulbright Senior Scholar Award, and Andrew Mellon Senior Fellowship in Humanities, and uh, two research and development grants from the Alliance of Independent Colleges of Art and Design. Um, Let's see, I'm kind of skipping around here a little bit. Um, I think I'm going to tell you that he is a uh, professor emeritus at the School of Art at Montana State University. And let Willem fill you in on everything else when he talks to you. So please welcome Willem to speak about his work. Thank you.
Thank you, and thanks for being here. Um, I want to thank Bonnie, certainly, not only for her intro, but for including me in, in this exhibition. It's really a delight. Uh, I think it's a very strong show. Um, all the artists are really great people. We've gotten to know each other socially a little bit the last few days because we've been wined and dined more than adequately. And, um, and they're, they're really interesting people, and the, the work is very diverse. And I, I think that's the strength, part of the strength of the, uh, of the exhibition. Um, so, and and I, I want to thank, obviously, all the sponsors and backers. And the catalog looks great. And if you haven't picked one up yet, you know, the, there's, I think, complimentary. complimentary catalogs on that table back there. that the ladies in the back are pointing to. And so uh, that way you can like, read artist statements and... Um, Get, get more detail on, on the individuals in the exhibition. But it's been a delight. It's been a great experience working with, with Bonnie and, and with the whole staff because they, they've been very uh, supportive, including somebody on the audiovisual staff who retaught me how to put this, this thing together. So we'll see how it works. Um, this, this piece, I'll just briefly say, is called Follow Your Bliss, which is a Joseph Campbell um, um, quotation, and I think it points at something that, in looking back, uh, I think I, I, I've tried to do is to follow kind of my own path. I mean, uh, um, following your own intuition, your own notion of what maybe life can be like, and, and if that sounds adventurous or risky, that's what I've, I've tried to do. And, and, and it stood me pretty well, I think. Um, after high school, for example, I didn't go straight to college. I went back to Europe. One time I left home for three years and served in the Dutch army, came back, had to re-immigrate um, back to the States. But the whole notion about um, having some sense of where you want your life to go and following that path. So here's my birth announcement on the right. <laughs> Start at the beginning here, right? And it, it, it'll give you some interesting clues, maybe. A, that my father was involved in the, he was a paper merchant. He worked for a large wholesale paper company called Proost, Proost & Brandt in Amsterdam. And he worked a lot with the graphics industry. So he had an illustrator that he had worked with before draw my birth announcement. And then they even come up with the idea of the safety pin and the little yellow stained, you know, um, <laughs> diaper. I think that was pretty cute, you know, so. And, and there's other allusions there. My father worked for a, um, um, a, an organization that put people to work who were out of work, uh, planting flowers in a park. And it was called Kleurenpro. This word right here, Kleurenpro. So he's using, it's sort of a pun. Uh, Kleurenpro means sort of the color of beauty. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, the beauty of color. And so he's put the beauty of here is the yellow in the diaper, obviously. On the left, you see a book that I was fascinated with, a page from a book that I was fascinated with as a child. They were all political illustrations uh, that were uh, done underground. And my father was very involved in providing paper to the underground press. And these were, after the war, at the end of the war, were published in book form and when my parents died, I inherited this, this volume, and I have used, as you'll see in a minute, using these images directly in my work. They were fascinating to me as a child because they were graphically really beautifully drawn, and this, this, this image just says, this is about the invasion uh, by the Germans of Holland in May of 1940, about six months after I was born. And um, I mean, that, that, that image just says it all. There, was no, there were no titles, no subtitles. You know, that, that image kind of tells you um, how the Dutch felt about that, that kind of invasion, uh, which is here equated with a home invasion, obviously. Here's my family. <laughs> and my father, in 1950, late 40s, 1950, with my mother, decided they were going to emigrate and they looked at Australia, New Zealand, and Tasmania, and South Africa, and there were reason, various reasons for not going to those countries, but he ended up deciding to go in the States. But he hired a, photo a professional photographer to document our life in our home in Amsterdam. 
which is great because we now, I actually have a little book that this is photographed, you see the binding in the center there, a book that documents my family in 1950. Um, my mother at this point is pregnant with the young man that's sitting back there. <laughs> And so I included a little photograph of my parents with um, a couple taken a couple of years later at our front door um, with uh, my brother Volker, who is here with his wife, Sandy. Um, my father was closely allied to the graphics industry, and this is a poster, which I think is really kind of beautiful. I actually found it online um, of my father's paper company and that uh, <clears throat> the kind of monogram that they developed in the center of the scroll of paper, the PMP, with the three X's, the PMP stands for post papier. The three X's is part of the coat of arms of Amsterdam, so the, the illustrator kind of um, you know, combined those. So I was around a lot of really great graphics. My father was also editor for a home organ which went out to the whole paper industry uh, that came out monthly, and it came out in a different format every month. So you could get, but it advertised the paper that they produced. So you might get a printed booklet, or you might get a series of photographs on beautiful glossy kind of paper, or you might get a puzzle, or you might get uh, a, a birthday calendar, so every month, the people in the paper industry in Holland got something in the mail that advertised the papers. So my father was very inventive. He never was an artist per se, but he was very, very inventive. And on the left is the original building. Um, I took this photograph, I think, when um, my son Jason, who was here, and I, we um, bicycled in Europe for a couple of weeks when I was on my Fulbright. And, um, this is actually now part of a hotel, believe it or not, but they had to retain the facade. But anyway, this is the part of the firm that published Bibles. Uh, they're the oldest Bible publishers in the hall, and that was a, a part of my father's industry. So it's just a, a long way of telling you that my father was very, very involved with the graphic arts industry and the paper industry, and he was himself very creative. Uh, this, uh, at the end of the war, um, I received a couple of coloring books. This one says, Children and Canadians, Kinderen and Canadese. And we were liberated by the Canadians in the north, whereas the south of the country was liberated by, um, by the Americans. And I have used um, that coloring book, or those two coloring books, as source material. So I look a lot in my work at things from popular, uh, popular culture. And uh, you'll see more examples of that coming on. And that's an early piece I did in 1995 about that era of my life, which was so important. I was six when the war, or almost six when the war ended. And so here's a little Dutch girl waving a Dutch flag at the liberating Canadian. If you look carefully, in the Canadian's left hand is a little tube, and it contains a cigarette. The cigarette was given to me by a Canadian soldier. Um, they came on our street and they gave candy to the kids and cigarettes to the adults, and of course I wanted the cigarette. So, so he gave me a cigarette and I gave it to my dad. He said, if you give it to your dad. So I gave it to my dad, my dad put it in a glass tube and saved it for me. When I was turned 18, right, I got the cigarette. And um, so uh, at one point, this piece, I was in a show with John Buck and uh, Ernie Pepion, and one other person had traveled in Canada for a year, and I got this phone call, somebody stolen the cigarette out of that. So I've been saying that the Canadians giveth and the Canadians taketh away. <laughs> Here's another page from that same book um, that, I, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, picturing the, 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 the Nazis as this kind of war machine. It's made up, as you can tell, out of uh, robot, he's like robotic. And so I did a big cutout for him, and then I did a cutout of one of the Canadian soldiers and pictured myself as a little boy, you know, waving Dutch flag, uh, welcoming uh, them uh, to, um, into Amsterdam. Um, here's two pieces. This is, now we're getting into 
a period when my father decides to emigrate. Uh, he first went to uh, New York, uh, then went to Seattle, then went to Houston, uh, all for different jobs, and then ended up back in Seattle and saying it's time for the family to come, and that was two years later. So the rest of the family came in 53, so he spent two years totally on savings, uh, allowing my, my family to stay in Amsterdam on savings and him earning some money in this country and trying to find, establish a place where it would be a good place for the family, to, for him to raise a family. And um, so I did this larger than life figure and it's called Portrait of My Father and it's now in the collection of the Yellowstone Art Museum. And um, on the left is a piece about my kind of memories of coming uh, to the U.S. We landed in Hoboken, spent a couple of days in New York, and then flew to Seattle. My mother and sister and, and uh, younger brother. And um, because we came in various stages because I had a couple of older sisters who were still in school and came later, etc. And so um, this one's called A Boy Visits New York. And you see the New York skyline. And I had not really seen neon before. So I depict the... And we went to an automat. I don't know if some of you have been to New, to New York in those days. You put a coin in and you open up this little trap door and you get a little, little dish out. And that was pretty fascinating to me. So um, that and neon and so the Statue of Liberty, of course, and a couple of other things that, that deal with seeing the, the big city. Um, this is a piece called Journey to the Promised Land. And so about uh, the leaving Holland on the left on that bench and being in the US on the right as, a, as an immigrant. So on the left you see, again, one of the soldiers, uh, Canadian soldier, you see Van Gogh, who's, as you know from my work, has been a, a fascination to me for many years. Um, the, the house, that I made a little house out of wood and concrete to depict the idea of leaving home you know, things are hunky-dory, everything is very peaceful, but yet my father took the, had the guts and my parents had the guts to leave that behind and start an entirely new life. And they were, my father was almost 50 when we emigrated and they had six kids, so that was quite, quite an adventure. And, and then the globe uh, to indicate sort of the, all, the, all the areas of the world that, that he considered moving to. And on the right, on that chair, are some things like um, that paint by number painting, which actually I think is the same one as is in Follow Your Bliss. And I see this, the paint by number paintings very often, it's very idealized you know, depictions of, of real life. And so I think of the immigrant's dream, the immigrant thinks of everything is gonna be just great when you come to this new country. And then of course they find all kinds of, you know, kind of financial problems and ethnic uh, and racist problems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, um, but, the paint by number painting has also become an aesthetic that I've sort of embraced, as you can tell in my work, so I wanted to depict that. And the camera on the floor for my love of photography, I started out as a photographer before I went into uh, art school. Uh, okay, so that's that piece. Um, then in high school, I uh, bought this 4x5 camera when I was 15, maybe 16, a 4x5 Crown Graphic. Um, I was thinking about going into photojournalism. My first job was with, with the Seattle Times. I had to go to maternity wards and pick up the recent births and type them up for the city editor. And I was 15, so I had to take a taxi. And then when I was 16, they gave me an allowance when I bought my first car. Uh, so, but, but I was a photographer for the high school. I went to Garfield High School. Uh, which is a great, I mean, you're coming from Holland as a kid and you're wearing short pants and, and you've never seen, you know, a person of an, almost never seen a person of another race. And you go to Garfield and there's Chinese and Japanese and blacks and whites and, you know, it was really a rich environment. It was just absolutely fantastic. And, and so I was a photographer for the newspaper and for the annual and I could get out of classes a lot because I'd, I'd have to say, I'm sorry, I have to go in the dark room. <laughs> and so I spent a lot of hours in the dark room uh, including doing my own work. And so, oops, I meant to say one more thing, and that's that. Uh, so there I am photographing the Seattle um, kind of landscape, uh, waterfront. And so I took the basic picture from a call ring book, but I put the Smith Tower in there. So those of you who know Seattle, this, uh, what, second from the left tall tower is the Smith Tower. And indeed, I had a job when I was 
a kid that the office was on the 17th floor. So the Smith Tower uh, was a board, and I put Mother Rainier in as well. Then I started to, began to hit the road. I started to get sort of anxious to, about seeing the States, and I bought this motor scooter. I was working, uh, some of you who've been in Seattle have been to Ivers. I had got a job with Ivers when I was, well, about that, that whole same era, 16 maybe. I still have the newsletter in which Ivor, uh, Ivor Hagland in, welcomes me into the, the business, you know, so that was pretty neat. Um, I bought the, I met somebody at Ivor's um, because I'd work late hours cleaning tables who knew of my itching to go and travel. And he said, well, the Bon Marche has this Cushman motor scooter and they've used it in a window display and they're selling it real cheap if you want it. And I went over there the next day for 25 bucks a month or something like that, you know, over a period of months. I bought it and one day I drove it home and my parents said, but you don't have a driver's license now. It was sort of, so what, you know? So, so I hit the road with that, and it ended up in this sculpture here. Um, the, it's called America the Beautiful, and I have a dealer in uh, Bozeman who collects paint by number paintings from me. She goes to garage sales, et cetera, and she'll call me up every couple of months and say, I've got some more. And, and so she said, you can just have this one, the original of this. She said, it's so ugly, you can just have it, you know? And of course, it was my favorite one. And I blew it up to, you know, these paper number paintings are on this kind of scale. And I blew it up to whatever that is, you know, eight, uh, eight by 10 feet or something like that. And then I put myself, based on a photo that my sister Elska, who was living in California, that, that, that picture of me on the scooter was taken in California when she and her husband lived in Vallejo. Um, and I took, a, I took the motor scooter um, all the way from Seattle to Vallejo and back during a spring break, I think, somewhere. And I had lots of adventures. And here it is at the uh, Missoula Art Museum in a show a couple of years ago. This, these are the kinds of things I started to encounter, and they were pretty wonderful to me. The Hatton Woods gas station. I mean, it, it, you don't see this kind of stuff in Holland, I'll tell you. you know. um, and, and look at the, I don't know if you can tell the s scale of the restrooms, but the door to the restrooms is about yay high. And um, this was, um, forget it, maybe um, near First Avenue or something like that. But anyway, I started to photograph these kinds of things. I thought, this is amazing stuff. And I don't even know why I was documenting it, but I started to document uh, roadside art is the general kind of term for this. And on my scooter, on my trip to California, indeed, I went to, I saw this um, drive through a tree and I, met Paul Bunyan, and that was, that's obviously a big fiberglass kind of figure, but all these things just struck me as being new and rich and interesting, and, uh, and I later on began to process it, but at the beginning I was just documenting it, including Neon. This is in uh, Sheridan, Wyoming, and it, you, know, you look at the kind of the power and the uh, vitality of that, this bunking bronco, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing um, and of course at night they really are wonderful. Sometimes when you look at all the older neon signs, especially the sequential ones that have numerous kind of images, in the, when you see them in daylight, they're real complex and, and kind of interesting as well. But at night, of course, they really light up, so to speak. Then I went back to Europe. So on the right, you see me hitchhiking and, and there's the drive-through tree. And I used, I used that piece to illustrate the fact that I was, uh, my wanderlust had not stopped, and I uh, left home in 59, I think, and I didn't come home until 62, and spent three years in Europe, basically, including I volunteered for a draft in Holland. I was, I was um, uh, um, enrolled with the draft in Seattle, and I came up with an agreement with them that if I served in a Dutch army, that I would be excused from serving again in this country. And especially because the Dutch Army said, you know, I kind of scouted them out and they said, well, we may send you to officer's training. And indeed, that's what they did. So I came out as a first lieutenant and, and, and so life actually wasn't, wasn't awful. And I was stationed with NATO in Germany. I had my choice of places to stay, uh, to, to serve. My first choice was New Guinea because the Dutch were still in New Guinea and that job was already taken. I was in transportation. And so I ended up, um, uh, being stationed uh, with NATO in uh, Celle, 
near Hanover. Then I met this lady. I came back to the States, met Diane in art school, and uh, we bought this Saab, and we did a lot of traveling. You see our extra gas can on top there. And um, as we got married, and we just celebrated our 50th anniversary, and we, um, I was in graduate school at Mills College, and so this was part of my thesis show. And I show this primarily to show you that I was beginning to add objects already then. You know, I, I, I went through some very, you know, it wasn't all consistent yet, but I was beginning to, this, this frame was actually from a real mirror frame, I think, and the fluorescent light, of course, was plugged in, and you see the cord down below there. So the, there were early hints of what, where my work was going to take me. Then, um, after about a year, I, my first job was at Ohio State University, and then I got hired at the Kansas City Art Institute, and I stayed there for 18 years. And here's the foundation faculty, and yes, that's me, top center. Uh, <laughs> slightly, you know, I've changed my identity a few times over the years. And these were all great people. The guy on the left, actually, I did, is still the head of the painting department in Kansas City. He and I did an exchange, and I taught in Leeds for a year, and he took my job in Kansas City, Warren Rosser, and some of you know him. And um, David Dunlap just retired from teaching at uh, University of Iowa. Jim Sejovic and I were just in a show this summer, at the one at the uh, bottom center. Um, he's still teaching. I'm not sure if Michael Myers is still teaching me. He teaches at the Chicago Art Institute, or taught until, at least until recently. They were all very interesting people, and I was extremely pleased to be hired by Kansas City by the first year program, it's the foundation program, because these people um, were passionate about teaching, they were passionate about making art, they were, and we got these great students, you know, I mean, uh, there's, there's at least one in the room here who, uh, who was at the Art Institute at that time when I first met teacher, that's Richard Notkin, and um, the students were passionate, and not only were they passionate about coming to a professional art school, but they were screened through a portfolio. So we got to look at their work and decide whether they were you know, ready to, to come or not, ready for art school or not. So they were really great students. Some of you know uh, Nick Cave, do you know his work? You know, I had him as a freshman, you know? And so he did some of his first performances in my class. So then we, in 86, so I was there for 18 years, so we skipped over that, and now we moved to Montana. I was recruited to become the director of the School of Art at Montana State University. That's our house, and the studio is the lighter building, top center there. And when you, so that's looking east, and you look west, um, there's this elk herd that we see almost every day. We see 150 or so elk right, right out, of the, out of the window. You know, it's pretty special. And uh, our neighbors are John Buck and Deborah Butterfield. And so we have some really great people in our community. And I started to do a few pieces about being in that kind of landscape, in that kind of environment. This piece is um, at the moment at the Yellowstone Art Museum. Um, and they're considering adding that to our collection. And that's about Yellowstone. So we're only 90 miles from Yellowstone. And, um, and the road that goes to and from Yellowstone is only a couple of miles from our, from our house. And so I, my take on Yellowstone is, is all the kind of the touristy kind of stuff, you know, the kind of stuff you bring home from the gift shop, you know. So it's called Yellowstone Wildlife, but as you can tell, they're all, you know, they don't all quite fit that. But it, it, so that was, that was a fun thing to put together. So I'm, I'm combining now neon with... In this case, it's not paint by number, but it's a, an old postcard I looked at. It's kind of simplified, you know. And um, little shelves that I make that I put the objects on. And, and also often I put, this, these are made out of redwood, put redwood shelves down below. So it's almost like grandma's kind of shelf with all the, you know, uh, objects that she loves having around. And indeed, when I buy these things in secondhand stores, I have a feeling that grandma dies and so everybody says, this stuff is so ugly, we've got to get rid of it and that it ends up in a second-hand store, and then I give it new life, you know. <laughs> Feels kind of good. Here you gotta see what my studio looks like and how I work, so here's the painted panel. So the first thing I do is I'll project an image onto it. I'll build the panel, this quarter-inch uh, birch plywood and a redwood frame. I project the image, paint it, 
and that usually takes me at least a couple of weeks to do. And then I have to, uh, I make a pattern for the neon, I take it to a guy that bends the neon for me, and I can give you more detail on that later if you're interested. And then, so by the time I finish the painting, the, the, uh, the neon's ready, then I have to drill, so I make, uh, make sure uh, where these holes for the electrodes have to be drilled. And, and then I mount the neon as I'm doing there on the right. And then it goes up on the wall. And the reason there's a handle on top temporarily is because I'm doing all this by myself. And this thing is getting pretty heavy at this point. So I climb up a ladder and I just hoist it up. You know, that, that, and then I remove the handle. And, uh, and then there's the finished piece. And then I started to, uh, as the longer we lived in Bozeman, the more we started to become a place to move to. Bozeman's on these constant lists of best places to retire to and start a business at and whatever. And so the, we're not the fastest growing city in Montana. We're the busiest airport in Montana. This is a little Bozeman. Uh, we're also, I think, one of the wealthier, becoming one of the wealthier kind of communities in Montana. So things are, are changing. And so I kind of gently try to hint at the things that are happening by, uh, in this Western landscape, comparing wildlife on the left, including the objects down below, with a plat for a development and putting objects down below that, a car, the, uh, the backhoe, uh, those kind, and a businessman. Um, so, I, and I love working diptychs. So diptychs are two panels that make up a single piece that are related to each other. Not just a continuation, but a, diff a different image. <clears throat> because you can kind of compare and contrast. It's really a nice device, I think. <clears throat> um, my pieces are often autobiographical. To make a long story short, uh, my wife and I and two music faculty took a group of students to Bali. One day we went swimming. I got caught in a riptide and uh, several, um, maybe four or five of us were way the hell out. Suddenly we realized we were way out from shore. And I started to swim back and we couldn't, of course you don't swim into a riptide. You have to, later on alert, you swim parallel to it until you get to a point where you can actually get back to the beach. <clears throat> but luckily, one of my students saw me struggling and he was able to make it through. He made it to the beach. I got a, some kind of board, you know, and I was able to get out and rescue a couple of us. <clears throat> so he saved my, uh, he saved my life. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there's the original painting that's based on. I turned it into black and white because this experience was sort of like a, a near-death experience. And, um, and so... And it ends up in a hospital, which I thought was very interesting. They, I sold it to the University of Kansas Hospital in Kansas City a couple of years ago, and they didn't, hadn't been aware. I mean, this has been picked by an art consultant, you know, in a gallery. And the hospital people didn't know what this was about. And I started telling these doctors and nurses the story, and suddenly they go, oh, you know, they were, it was, it was, they found it very interesting that this thing ended up in a hospital, and I do too. <clears throat> this piece is, this is your life, it's about our son, Jason, who's sitting here, who uh, at one point we get a phone call and um, he and two other boys have been joyriding and we're in a terrible wreck, a 500 foot accident pattern, the, pat the patrolman told me. <clears throat> and um, so I thought, suddenly we were aware we have this teenager on our hands and we, you don't know where, where life's gonna go. And so I, his life is depicted in this car that's flipping, and you don't know if it's going to land on its wheels or was, you know, or or not. <clears throat> and then there's a chair for Diana, a chair for me. So the camera represents me, his little red camera there, and the purse obviously represents Diane. And we're watching his life unfold, and luckily it turned out just great. But uh, at the time when he's 15, right? You don't know. And this ended up in the collection of the uh, museum in Spokane. <clears throat> Uh, this um, piece has an interesting kind of story. Um, I, had done the, I had done the piece, and a couple of years later, um, and some of you know Gordon McConnell, um, he 
was asked to give a lecture at the Booth Western Art Museum. And he said, I, I want to show some slides of contemporary Montana artists. Could I have some of your slides? So I gave him some slides. And he came back and he said, they really like your work. You ought to send him some slides. And I thought, they're a Western Art Museum. They're not going to ever be in some of my work, seriously. you know." And the director calls me up and he says, we'd like to buy one of your pieces. And so we negotiated over a period of about a year. And it turns out they had just doubled the size of their museum. Uh, I asked them, what am I mounting it on? He sa I said, do you have uh, sheetrock over plywood? He said, no, no, it's polished limestone. I said, great, you know. What kind of drill bits do I bring? <laughs> and he said, no, no, we'll take care of it. You know, just bring, bring the piece. So I loaded it up and, and drove it down to Georgia. It's outside of uh, Atlanta. And, um, and they did all the, you know, they assigned three people to me to have a huge staff and they took care of it, you know, and, and uh, it, it was great. All I had to do is really lift the panels up and hang them and they did everything else like a real museum should, right? There you go. And um, um, so they just doubled the size of the museum and um, this limestone was quarried in Bulgaria and then shipped to Savannah and a truck to Cartersville, Georgia. And, and it was a huge space. And what they wanted to do, which I thought was real brilliant, was to have a wing of contemporary takes on the West, you know, not the traditional Western. So, so inside, you walk inside, and there's Andy Warhols and other, other artists who have their own unique vision of the West. And, and so mine stayed in this wonderful, you come up these large stairs and there's my, my piece right there. It's really a, a great location for it. <clears throat> this piece I just sold a couple of years ago to uh, Montana State University. It was a percent for art project. And I applied because I really thought it was great after having taught there for 16 years to have a piece on campus. And uh, I was actually the only Montana artist picked for that. The others were from Colorado and other places, uh, or somebody from the East Coast. Um, and this is, you come out the big lecture hall, and this is the piece that you see. And it's called Home on the Range, and you can tell what's happening to the range, right? I mean, it's getting built on. <clears throat> this is, uh, here's some of my family, actually, uh, visiting a couple of years ago. And this, I get a call from the, or an email from the editor of Alaska Airlines magazine. She said, we're doing a review of a hotel in Seattle and we'd like to include your piece. And I said, I don't have a piece in, in, in your hotel or in that hotel. And she said, oh yes, there is. And it turns out I'd sold it to the guy who developed, who was the developer for the hotel. And they decided to move it out of their offices. And according to the general manager, they re redecorated the whole lobby to fit that piece. Now, I, that may not be true, but it's a great story, I like you. <laughs> Um, and so a couple of years, when that first happened, I, uh, I said to my family, half facetiously, I'll buy you a drink um, you know, if you come and see it this summer. So my family shows up and they don't have a bar, they don't have a restaurant. So we went out for, we had a meal afterwards, but it was fun. Um, and so this is in the lobby and it's called, But You Can't. And it's sort of like a woman gesturing at me. That's me again. So I just photographed myself. I, I posed myself, put my camera on a self timer on a tripod. And, and it's pretty easy to do. And, um, and it's sort of like somebody saying, but you can't do that. Well, it harks back to that, uh, you know, follow your bliss, you know? It's like, yes, I can, and I should do what I need to do. And so, and they have a big plaque with it because they think it really fits the, men the, the mentality of, of their approach to business. And so they, so it actually brought it into the hotel partially because they think it's their approach to life and business. These are some of the things I collect. So obviously pay my number of paintings. That's the kind of junk store. I think it's one in Virginia where I bought some things. A postcard collection, um, metal ashtrays in the shape of states, glasses. <laughs> and we're actually now at a stage where we're beginning to divest our collection. So we also have a big folk art collection and we're just beginning to talk to the Kohler Foundation in, in Sheboygan uh, about donating our collection to them. So. And I've just given away 5,000 slides to an organization in California. So it's a time of life when we're divesting ourselves. But as you can tell, I've collected a lot of stuff. This is a photo I took in 1977, our first visit to Howard Finster. Some of you know Howard Finster and his work. Uh, he built, he was a preacher who built a kind of Christian sermon-based environment called Paradise Garden. 
and it's 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 really wonderful. And I got to know Howard Finster quite well because I visited him a bunch of times. And he, so here's Diane and my son Jason looking looking at this. And 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 Howard Finster told me he said, I can use anything you bring me. And if you look at that, you know, there's all kinds of found objects in there. And I thought, he, in a way, he was giving me permission. It was okay to use a lot of different stuff, you know, like, again, follow your own vision. And there's Howard and I. <laughs> yeah. He was great. And he was, um, <clears throat> actually, when uh, we bought, Diane and I bought a painting from him when, the first time we visited, the 1977 visit. And it's called What is the Soul of Man? And um, we actually ended up selling it. Uh, I, bought, I paid 80 bucks for it. We sold it for 20,000 to uh, the, the High Museum in Atlanta has, has that in their collection now. So, this, you know, when we were first collecting, there weren't that many people. There was just a handful of people in this country were collecting kind of contemporary American folk art. And so we had a network. And so we'd go, one time we went into Appalachia and we called a guy who was an artist on the faculty at Appalachian State and said, who should we go see? And he gave us a bunch of names. And in Jackson, Mississippi, I met somebody who worked uh, for the State Historical Society, and she was interested in that phenomenon. So we have now, now there's magazines, there's lots of books, you know, there's a huge network of that now, galleries, it's overpriced. It was great. We went to individual artists, bought stuff directly from the artist in, what, 75% of the cases probably, didn't pay a huge amount of money. I mean, even that painting we bought from Howard Finzer, we made four payments of 20 bucks because we didn't have just 80 bucks cash to give to somebody, you know. So, different days, you know, that was in the 70s. Um, and this piece kind of ties in with maybe with Howard Finzer in a funny kind of way. I love maps, and of course, being an immigrant, I look at the, the, the map of the United States as the sort of, it's the, the, uh, the kind of welcome into uh, the new land. And so I've done a whole series of map pieces. So here there's four or five different paint by number paintings, one for the west, one for the midwest, one for the uh, southeast and the northeast. And then I call it invasive species because all these critters that I pick up in junk stores are primarily made in China and, and Taiwan. So that's why I refer to them as invasive species. And then the, uh, this is one of the first times I used some commercial neon. You can get these things online. And so I, you pay 50 bucks for these things, you know? And so, uh, and this one actually started to fade after a while. It's not the highest quality neon. I just go to, back to the company and buy another one, you know? Here's another, this one's much bigger. This one's probably 10 feet across. It's called Birds of North America. And people think they're the state birds. Well, if you look at it a little more carefully, you'll see they're not the state birds. Um, but it was fun to do. So I did a big map of just of these kind of pastel colors that you find in old maps. And then they went to junk stores and found, uh, found birds that kind of fit that. And uh, again, there's a, a, um, a, uh, a neon uh, flamingo from that same company. And uh, an old, a former student of mine, an old friend of mine, um, uh, Charlie, uh, lives in Denver and came to my, this was in a show in Denver. And while she was visiting and looking at my show, apparently a woman walks in with, a, with this giant parrot or whatever it is. Huh? A macaw. Thank you. And so her husband took a photo, and I think that's a, good, just a great document to have, you know, the bird in front of the bird sculpture. This is a show that I had at the Holter Museum of Art, um, and, and Dick and I both served on the board there for a number of years, and have a a strong affection for that, uh, for that museum. Um, this is a really very nice kind of space. And, um, but to indicate to you how people look at my work sometimes, this show was called The Nature of Collecting. So it was more to focus a little bit more on collecting stuff. We're getting close here. <laughs> and um, as you have been able to tell if you've seen the show I'm quite enamored with Vincent van Gogh. He's Dutch. He's passionate about his work. You know, he was an outsider in the sense that he obviously wasn't very accepted by, except by a few artists, but not by the larger kind of community. 
um, obviously a troubled, troubled man, but he persisted. And so he becomes sort of a, a romantic kind of hero for many of us. And so I did this piece at the time of his, uh, the, the 100th anniversary of his death. This was at the Museum of the Rockies. I had a solo show there. That piece on the top right is in this show, the one on the bench. Those are all hats, by the way, taken from his self-portraits. And that's in the collection of uh, Paris Clipton Square. And this is uh, the most recent piece, again, about, uh, about Vincent. Um, so I took the, the, the famous painting and turned it into a paint-by-number painting. And I thought it wouldn't be interesting to kind of juxtapose that to an actual kind of night sky. Because it's called, what is it called? Night, night sky in our all, right? Yeah. And so, um, and so I found uh, this uh, constellation, Perseus, that, that, that fit the proportions of the panel uh, well. And I often work on these kind of blackboard kind of surfaces. It's A, kind of reference to childhood and being childlike, maybe. But also, it's a great way of depicting kind of like a night sky because you get that kind of haze from the, like the, the kind of thing you see around the Milky Way, you know. So I, I start drawing with chalk and then I rub it with my fingers and I work it with a sponge and, and you get a really interesting kind of backdrop for the neon. And I just finished that a couple of months ago. And then a few pieces that I wanted to show you. I just had a show at the uh, Yellowstone Art Museum of all my pieces about the war and the Holocaust. And very briefly, um, I learned about 10 years ago that 176 kids from my school, my elementary school, died in the Holocaust. And so I've been doing a lot of work about that. And I can only work on so many, you know, for so long. Um, but um, this was a, a show that was all based, that was that entire series. So these are all, in one way or another, uh, the most recent one at this point was that pile of wooden shoes. I bought all these wooden shoes online, and they're usually made as souvenirs, so they have a gaudy kind of painting them. So I sand them all down to bare wood, and they fucking look like human skin, you know? So, so I, I continue to work on, on, on that series slowly uh, but surely. Uh, the, um, a current, still currently teaching teacher at my elementary school is the one who notified me ab about the fact that they were celebrating, the school was celebrating its 80th anniversary. So the start, school was started in 1926. It's the first public Montessori school outside of Italy, I, I, I learned fairly recently. And um, he wrote, he wanted to focus the reunion and that celebration, the anniversary, on the war years and how the war had affected the school. And so he's the one who did all the research that unearthed the fact that that many kids from my school had, had died. And that I can go on about more detail if anybody's interested later. But he wrote this book about that, and that's my school. And then it got translated into English by a woman who attended my school who was a dean in the Cal State system. She emigrated in 1949, and she'd actually gone to school earlier with the same school. She'd gone to school with Anne Frank and then transferred to my school, probably because she moved neighborhoods, or so, I'm not sure. And her name is Honey Voris, and she came to see us in, in Bozeman a couple of years ago, so we've met her. So it's called Storming the Tulips, and we were just at the Holocaust Museum Library, uh, donated my father's uh, memoir to the Holocaust Museum, and met with the head librarian, and they have all these books in their collection. And here's uh, Ronald Saunders, uh, my sister, Nani, uh, uh, visited uh, the school a couple of years ago and met with him and took his photograph. And that's at the end of the book, there's this whole list of the names of the victims, um, the, the, the date they died, uh, the camp they died in, and their age. And one of the pieces I did is this installation here. I made one suitcase for each one of the children and I painted on the, the name and the date and the camp they died at and their age. And at each venue, I invite volunteers to assist me, or actually, I just say, you, can you install this for me? So that they have 176 units. So there's also a neon piece I'll show you outside in a minute. And so the volunteers then are carrying these suitcases, and they're actually directly confronted with that information. So they're reading the stuff, and they're processing the fact that all these children died. And so I, I, 
it's a way of bringing that information home. This was uh, installed by uh, three students and a teacher at Montana State University in Billings. The museum that it was shown at was in Billings. And they, and they come with a whole different way. Every time it looks totally different. And you'll see that in these slides here. So here on the left, it was, well, actually both of these images are from Terman Larison uh, with uh, Akio just outside the door. So I thought it was fun because Akio is in the show to show you that I've uh, been in his company before. And actually Akio uh, came to study ceramics in Kansas City um, and his wheel, his pottery wheel was right next to my wife's. And so we go back to the early, early 70s, Diane, something like that, right? And so, um, so in this case, um, you know, they open up some of the suitcases and they stack them and it's almost like lives tossed away, you know, that kind of, you know. So uh, it, it's, uh, it's been powerful for me, but it's also, it's affected a lot of people. And of course, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm, I use it and I talk to a lot of fourth and fifth graders about the war and so um, it's a way of, of teaching about those terrible events. Here they're setting it up at, uh, Bozeman High School has its own gallery, and it's phenomenal, and they have a great art department, and it's one of the top 100 high schools in the country academically. It's a great high school. And, and so um, their art club uh, is setting it up here. And on the right is a gallery that's run by students at the uh, University of Montana in Missoula. So their students are setting it up. So I always ask volunteers, and I give them some guidance, but I don't, I don't uh, get involved in it really at all. I mean, I've hardly ever said, no, you can't do that. You know? and I also have blocks of wood because these things have hinges on the back and so they can stack them. So you can put things in between, sometimes they stack them up. They do different things with them. And this is, a, this is the last slide. And this is a piece that I just donated to the um, Yeltsin Art Museum and it's called Childhood Lost and it's like, these, so I made a big stack of suitcases and then surrounded them with objects that, that kind of speak to children's lives and they obviously didn't have a childhood or, or it got severely interrupted. And on the top, the top suitcase, I was painted by my granddaughter uh, who is now in her 20s and living in Anchorage, Alaska. But um, when she was, I don't know how old she was, but maybe when she was seven or eight or nine or whatever, she did these paintings that I put on a little top suitcase. That's all I have. Thank you. So if anybody has any questions for Willem, um, just raise your hand, and I'm going to repeat the question so everybody can hear it, and then we'll answer yes. Um, on the first, on oh, the there, first you um, slide, the uh, painting had two dates, and I'm just curious, what, it was 1994 and 2015? Oh, yeah, I was going to go to it, but I can't do that. What? Yes. Um, um, let's see if I can simplify the story. Um, the, I was interested in donating a sculpture to the uh, Missoula Art Museum, and I sent them some slides, and they gave me a bunch of slides of things they were potentially interested in. And that was one of them. I went into my sheds, and it had, hadn't been out of the sheds for years. I hadn't been shown. I hadn't shown it for a while. I noticed it was pretty badly damaged. Moisture had gotten to it, and the paint had cracked. So I decided this piece needs to survive a little bit longer. So I completely remade the piece. So that's why it has a current date on it. So it's actually the same image, but completely new panels and new paint. And the same is true for, not quite the same, but uh, for a piece that's called Silent City. If it, you'll see it if you go into the galleries. It's blue birds on an urban, in an urban scene. And that has uh, a double date in it as well. And that's because I changed the neon entirely on that piece. So I wasn't showing it anymore. And I thought, why am I not showing it? Well, I had done all these multicolored birds. And I thought it was kind of distracting, and it was about a series event. It was basically based on 9-11. Not directly, but sort of indirectly. And so the bluebirds were much more appropriate in a quieter kind of sense. So I gave it a, 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 the date of 2015 as well. 
talking about the bluebirds, when I looked at that, I thought of the people, children thought there were birds falling from the buildings in 9-11. Oh. I thought that's what you were making reference oh, to, but not interesting. true. Yeah, oh, interesting. Well, and that's what I like. I mean, that's, that's the great thing for an artist to get their work out, because then you get people responding, right? And then you, then you think, oh, I never thought about reading it that way, but that's interesting, you know? So I like, I like hearing that, yeah. yeah. Because art is really about a conversation, a dialogue we're having with, 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 with uh, our, our public. And, um, uh, and I, get, I get takes on things sometimes that I hadn't expected, you know? But um, it means that we're communicating somehow, you know, we're reaching people and they're responding and that's really ultimately, I mean, if we didn't show our work, the, 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 the work may be great or it may not be, but it's, if it's in a shed or in a storeroom, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it can't do that. And so that's why it's, again, it's great to have an opportunity to show it in, in, in a place like this and in a different kind of place. I mean, I, I show all over the country, but I've never shown in Portland before, so it's kind of interesting. So sometimes I get responses that are more regional, you know. And like to the suitcase pieces that I just showed you, I mean, I had a, I had a guy in his, he was in his late 70s show up at one of the installations, and he starts telling me about what happened to his family during the war. And we were both. Glass of champagne in our hands, tears running down our face, you know. So you, you don't know what's going to happen, but, you know, but you are, you are reaching out. You have ideas, you know. You're reaching out to people. And, and, and then you uh, accept whatever kind of, you receive uh, information, and, di and it's a dialogue. Yeah. Yes? In your uh, reproductions of the paint by numbers, how accurate are the colors that you choose? Uh, yeah. No, I, just, I usually stick pretty closely to those because they use this kind of funny pastelish kind of colors, and I really like that that whole language of color. So I usually stick pretty close. Um, there are some cases. At one time, I bought an image uh, of the Southwest, the one that's called "Looking Back," that was uh, had been badly damaged, and I had to actually finish the paint by number painting or repaint it, and so I had to invent it because I didn't know what the original intention of the colors was, but. I love those kind of slightly pastelish kind of colors. And I, I use this um, commercial house paint. I use uh, acrylic latex. And, um, and I actually have, basically have most of them I mix up from, from three primaries. I mix my own. And I, I mix and I test and I mix and I test and I hold it up next to the painting, you know, until I get it right. And um, so I, pro I project an image, do a pencil drawing, and then start mixing. And it takes me, on the big ones, it takes me three weeks sometimes to get a painting done, you know. But anyway, but that's a good question. So I, I like those colors, yeah. And so I usually stick with those, yeah. Occasionally, I'll get just a pattern. There, are, there were uh, paint by number uh, patterns um, where I don't always know what the key was. And so I'll make up my own. That, that, that has happened, yeah. Thank you, yeah, good question, yeah. Well, I, I guess it's sort of a reaction. Maybe there's a question as well. I really um, appreciated the picture of you on the Cushman scooter because I remember the ads for those in Boys Life magazine when I was growing up. I, I was just uh, kind of dumbstruck, though, when you said you took it on this trip to California for two reasons. One, I think they didn't go faster than about 35 miles an hour. And how did you ever get your parents to agree to that? So that, there's a question for you. <laughs> Good. Uh, th those are interesting questions. Um, a, my parents were always very supportive. One time when I left home and I didn't come home for three years, my father said something very mysterious. I don't quite understand. He said, keep up the family name. <laughs> well? <laughs> what? He said, that won't be too hard. Oh, yeah. Then he said, that won't be too hard. He said, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so um, my parents were always, they were great parents because they were supportive of each of us individually in terms of our interests. So when I was 16 and I did get my driver's license, I bought a 1939 Plymouth for 20 bucks and I started to hit the road, you know? And, um, and it was like, well, we'll see you in a couple of months or a couple of weeks or whatever, you know? And, but also because we're 
we couldn't take money, we couldn't export money from Holland in those days. And so we came with very little money. I think we were allowed $1,000 per person. So we started out live sort of with 8,000 bucks, you know. And so, um, so we had annual budget meetings. And when I was 14, I had to bring in 750 bucks a year. And so I immediately had to go to work. And my father expected me to turn it all over to him. Uh-uh. You know, because I started to enjoy the, the fact of having a little money. So I started to buy uh, scooters and cars and go on trips. And so I, I became more independent pretty quickly. And it must have been very, very difficult for me. I will, I will admit that because I was probably at the most problematic kind of age of being a teenager and wanted to go and explore the world. And, and so, but they basically... Uh, gave me permission to do that and support to do that, you know, which was really, really great. And the Cushman motor scooter will go 55 miles an hour downhill. <laughs> and, and what happened was I was in Northern California and I think, well, let's see how fast this baby will go, right? And I'm going, I, I don't think it had a speedometer, but, uh, you know, I was going pretty fast. And so I hear this, bing! And the chain broke and I flung it into the woods. And of course, I'm going so fast that I, I stopped, and I went back to where I thought the chain had broken. I spent hours in the woods looking for that chain. So what I did, I walked it, and I found a little resort with cabins, and there was nobody home. So I parked the thing, I got out my sleeping bag, I took a nap, and the people came home, and they said, oh, they had a son, it turns out. They said, oh, you can sleep in one of the cabins. And the next day, I hitchhiked into Crescent City, and went to a machine shop, and I said, I need a piece of chain by Yale Long. You know, I forget how I measured it. And I went back, I hitchhiked back, I hammered it on, and I was on my way. And that literally happened, you know. So you learn to solve problems. And that's a good thing about being independent pretty early. You know, having your own money so you can make some mistakes early on and, and exploring the world. You know, um, yeah, I, th I think uh, it, was, it was actually, uh, looking back, it was a great way of growing up, you know. Uh, having uh, supportive parents, Little money in your pocket, you know, it's great. Yes, ma'am. I was just thinking, then the, they didn't have the freeways, right? So the speed was, the speed was uh, more reasonable for a scooter. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. There were no, yeah, the, the interstate and the freeways hadn't hadn't come in yet. Yeah, um, and I did I did have two Cushmans, by the way, and I wrecked one in Seattle. Somebody ran into me, or I ran into somebody, and insurance paid for it, and I bought another one. You know, so. <laughs> But then I graduated to a Veloset, a British motorcycle, and I, uh, that was in Ohio, and I did some great road trips on that, but um, yes. On the same thing with problem solving, how did you find working with Leon originally when you first started? How did you find what? How did you find working with Leon originally when you first started? Because I imagine it should be quite open. Oh, Leon, yeah. Oh, good. So your question was about how I, how I found the neon. Uh, well, the neon signage, of course, really fascinated me because um, I hadn't seen much of it. And so when I first started to, wanted to work with neon, I was in the late 60s, and I went to a neon sign company in Kansas City, and I said, how do you do it? And they said, you make a pattern. And you have to make it backwards because there's electrodes sticking out, so they come out the back, you know. So you do, you do a pattern. So I asked them about that, and I asked them about transformers, and and the wiring systems. And so um, I've had in all these years, since the late 60s, I will have three guys do my neon. So they, they do it forever. The, the next to last man that worked for me, Bill Todd in Bozeman, retired at 85 and he, from his sign shop. And he was having trouble with his vision. So I'd get these welds, you know, because you have to weld pieces of glass together. So the neon comes in straight sticks, as they refer to it. They're usually about four feet long. And they are, they can be colored either by different gases or colored glass or fluorescent powder on the inside of the tubing. Has there ever been a shape that you wanted to do what they could achieve? What, what they do is they start with a straight stick and they bend it over a ribbon burner and they, they can lengthen or shorten that distance of how much they want to heat. They heat a small section and they turn right around and lay it right onto your pattern and then bend maybe that much of it. And then they heat another section and they go through the whole thing. And then the electrodes get welded onto the ends. And then one of the electrodes has a little vent on it. 
and that gets pumped with gas. And the gas is either neon, which burns red, or argon with a little mercury in it, which burns blue. And those are basically, you can do other, you can do helium, you can do other kinds of things, but those are the two most commonly used gases in the sign industry. And the people that do my work basically work in the sign industry. Although they really love working for an artist, you know, because it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not mundane stuff. And so they're always, I, I, I have really, a guy that works for me right now is John Nyman in Billings. So I mail him the pattern, and then a couple weeks later, or whatever, he says it's done. I go to Billings, I go junking, pick up some more quitters, you know, in the junk stores, and uh, pick up the neon, and I'm back in business, you know. But, uh, anyway, that, that's a, yes, ma'am. Sure. I am, it was interesting, moving to Montana was interesting because in Kansas City there was this urban stress all the time, well, which I guess you would get here too. I mean, uh, we lived in, the, the, the Art Institute was in a part of the city that had a lot of drug houses in it in those days and a lot of traffic, a lot of crime, you know, it was really stressful. We don't have those kinds of stresses quite the same way. We have stresses, but not quite that way. So I think we've added some years to our lives just by living in Montana and looking at that elk herd and skiing right out the front door. We cross country ski right out the front door. We could literally keep our skis on the porch, you know? And all our neighbors have large ranches and all our neighbors are just great people. I and mean, they are CEOs of major corporations to young authors, you know, but a really interesting mix of people. And we have, we feel like we really have a nice sense of neighborhood and a nice sense of community. So that's, I think, adding um, to our longevity, probably. And because you live out there, you have to chop wood, because we heat entirely with wood. So we have three wood stoves, one in the studio, one downstairs, and one upstairs. So a lot of wood to be chopped. And um, there's a lot of physical stuff involved in living in Montana, you know. And so we ski, we hike, we haven't backpacked for a while, but you know, so, um, and my perspective partially is like, it seems like if you keep on being engaged with your community, in my case with art making, if you have passion for that, uh, reaching out. I have a, also teaching has been a really um, rewarding career. I'm in touch with a lot of former students, one of whom is sitting right here. Um, so, um, that you get the sense of what these people, that you had a role in building these people's lives, you know? And so, so that's maybe another reason uh, for, you know, staying healthy and, and happy. And a happy marriage, you know? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I think there'd be a lot of things, you know, but, but those are some of the things that come to mind, you yeah. know? Yeah, let's, if you're interested in going into the museum, and, and, or you are in the museum, but into the gallery, yeah, then we'll, uh, we'll continue out there.